Okay, in this video I'm going to go through ISB task 4 for uh, mechanics, uh, LXL physics. I'm just going to turn the light on. There we go. Make sure it backlights up on the camera. Um, I see it's task 4 for unit 1 uh, mechanics of AS LXL physics. Um, so this task is really going to look at the idea of using trigonometry and uh, using um, that to find horizontal and vertical components of forces um, and the idea of equilibrium or statics as it's also known. Okay, so if you want to, to read through some pages to prepare you for, this is page 31 to 33 from the course textbook. Okay, but let's get straight to the explaining everything for this and then we can get into the questions. There's only two questions on this one, so it should be a, a fairly short task compared to some of the others. Okay, so talking about the idea of an object traveling at constant velocity okay, down a slope. So let's just put a ball on this slope. So let's draw a diagram, uh, a, a free body force diagram and a vector triangle to explain how you could calculate the size of the forces acting on the object. Okay, so we're going to use the word balanced equal reaction acceleration perpendicular uh, opposite component frictional slope and trigonometry as we do this. So here's our slope. Okay, looks like the ball's rolling down it. All I'm doing is rotating a piece of paper. Okay, so here's our slope. Okay, we've got a uh, weight, uh, the weight of the object, the weight of the ball, which goes directly down. Okay, and then we've got the contact force from the slope onto the ball. Uh, let's just call that F. Uh, let's actually let's call it C for contact force. And then we've got the idea of some frictional force actually acting against this as well. Now this ball is going at a constant speed, a constant velocity. Now that's key, because if something's at a constant velocity, we know that the resultant force must equal zero. So when we draw this as a free body force diagram, it's literally a look as it is right now. So we've got these forces acting on it. Okay, uh, but as we draw it as a vector triangle or a vector diagram, okay, it's gonna be a closed vector diagram. So remember in terms of vector diagrams, everything is drawn tip to tail. So weight would be the first one in then you've got the contact force and then you've got your force due to uh, friction okay <clears throat> now what you've got to remember here is the forces acting on this are balanced so let's say tie in the idea of balance or the, uh, so the horizontal forces must be equal to the vertical forces okay so the sum of all the horizontal forces must be equal to the sum of all the vertical forces and we use trigonometry to allow us to do that remember c is perpendicular to this slope Okay, C is acting perpendicular to the slope. So, uh, if we knew the angle of this slope, okay, we could figure out uh, what this angle was from the vertical, okay, which will allow us to figure out the other angles on it. Okay, so we could figure out. So this angle over is 90 degrees. Okay, we know that one already. Um, so we can. We know this is 90 degrees over here. So we can figure out the size of this angle if we know this angle. Okay, it's pretty straightforward this idea. Remember, these two angles are, um, are of equal sizes. Okay, um, so this allows us to figure out the size of the the angle of this from the horizontal if we want to, or the angle of that from the vertical as well if we want to. Okay, so we've got pretty straightforward ideas in terms of what's going on. Okay, <clears throat> so what we're going to do once we actually figure out the idea, the size of this angle. Once you figure out the size of this angle and the size of this force. Uh, you can resolve that into verticals and horizontal forces. So let me go through an example of that. If C was at an angle of 30 degrees and was 7 newtons, I could resolve that into the vertical and horizontal forces that make that up. So let's do that. Uh, if we wanted the vertical, we've got a triangle here. Okay, So that's going to be um, the opposite. That's the hypotenuse and that's the adjacent. So we wanted the horizontal, sorry, let's say. So that's the adjacent. So we've got the hypotenuse and the adjacent, so that's cos. So essentially it's going to be 7 cos. So let's just write it all out so we can see it. So I'll okay. cut to it. Okay. So it's going to be cos. And it's going to be uh, cover up adjacent because that's what we want. So it's going to be cos of the angle times by the hypotenuse. So we're going to end up with 7 cos 30. Um, as a value of a, so it's about six. Okay, <clears throat> seven cos thirty. But if we want this side over here going up, okay, we want the opposite. Uh, we've got to um, multiply the hypotenuse by sine of the angle this time, because we've got the opposite. 
the opposite is equal to sine 30 times by the point units, so 7 sine 30, okay, and that's equal to 3.5. Okay, so that gives us the sides of the triangle that we have here. So what we've got to remember from this situation is you can do that for all of these. And essentially, whatever the vertical components are, whatever all the vertical components are, they must be equal to zero. So if this was 3.5, and say we figure this one out to be 3.5, then the weight must equal that. So it must be equal to 7. So say we figure out this horizontal component out to be 6, as we did, the horizontal component of this must also be 6, okay? Because they're the only forces acting horizontally, this has no horizontal force, therefore the horizontal of these two must cancel each other out. Okay, so that covers everything for the explaining of the task. Let's now get stuck into some questions on this. So let's look for task four. If I'm correct, this question with a helicopter. Yep, there we go. Okay, so <coughs> we've got two forces acting on this helicopter. Um, it's hovering at a constant height. If it's at a constant height, there's no acceleration. If there's no acceleration, that must mean, if there's no acceleration, that must mean that uh, the force is acting on a balance. In this situation, two forces are equal magnitude. So that's exactly what I said. The mass of the helicopter is 150 grams. Calculate the magnitude of the lift force. Well, if you figure out the weight, the weight must be equal to lift. So literally, it's W is equal to mg. Okay, with the mass now being... Uh, 1,500 kilograms, and you multiply that by 9.81. So whatever that the value of that is, that is equal to weight, which is also equal to the lift force. Okay, whatever the lift is. Forward thrust is obtained by tilting the helicopter by 17 degrees. The four, the speed of the rotor blades increase so that the helicopter remains at the same height as it accelerates forward. So the height isn't changing still, but what we've got now is a lift force acting at a different angle um, to the vertical. Explain why the vertical component of the force produced by the rotor blades must still be equal to the magnitude of the weight. Okay, because it's at a constant height, that's the reason why. The force produced by the rotor blades is now 15,400. Show that the horizontal component of this force is 4,500. Okay, so we've got a triangle here. Okay, this over here is 15,400 newtons. Okay, the angle that this is acting at is 17. Um, degrees. And what we could do is we could use our value of weight from before, apply it to this side and use Pythagoras to figure out that because it must be the case because it's at the same height. But the easier way, the quicker way of doing it is trigonometry here. Okay, It's going to produce a, a, a more accurate answer because we haven't got no rounding errors from before as well. So here, this is a right angle triangle, poorly drawn right angle triangle. Okay, We want our opposite because they want the um, horizontal component, so we want the opposite. We have the hypotenuse. Okay. So opposite and hypotenuse is in so for um, sine. So you cover up your O, sine of the angle multiplied by the hypotenuse. Okay, so let's do that. So sine 17, and we multiply that by our hypotenuse. Oops. Of 15,400. So that's about four. So that ends up being 4,500 and three newtons, which is approximately equal to 4,500 newtons. It's exactly what they were after. Excellent. Nice question to get there. Okay, show me questions are always good. Um, so remember, you're trying to, sh to show what they want you to get. So you can always check to see whether you got it right because of the fact that you're getting what they're asking for. Calculate the forward acceleration of the helicopter. Well, we've got the horizontal uh, motion. So remember, it's moving forward horizontally. So we've got the size of horizontal force. Um, we've got the mass, um, which is 1,500 newtons. So the acceleration. So F equals MA, A is equal to, F equals MA, A is equal to F over M, which is equal to 4,500 divided by uh, 15,000, which is going to be equal to, so 1,500, 4,500 divided by 1,400, which is equal to 3 meters per second squared. Nice question to get again. Okay, two marks, pretty standard question. Calculate the horizontal distance the helicopter will have travelled from rest after 10 seconds, assume the acceleration is constant. Okay, so SUVAT, going back to the early ISP tasks. Okay, they want the distance. We know the initial velocity was zero. We don't know the final velocity, but we don't really need it. Okay, what they want is the distance. We know the acceleration is three. We know the time is 10. Okay, so we've got three pieces of information. That's all we need, U, A, and T. So S 
is equal to ut plus half at squared. Okay, ut disappears because u is equal to zero, so s is equal to half at squared. Okay. So 0.5, sorry, I just put my calculator around, I'll lift that up first. There we go, that's all we're working for that. I'll slip that in there. 0.5 times by, no, uh, not 9.81, so you used to put 9.81 there, it's 3 times by uh, 10 squared, which is 100, makes it nice and easy. So 150 metres is how far it's travelled. Explain whether this is likely to be the actual distance travelled uh, in this time or no, but partly because the acceleration won't always be constant. Of course, there will be air resistance acting against it, so the actual distance will be less. So let's just check question 15. Okay, so yeah, we did that. Okay, that's exactly what we did. Uh, no vertical acceleration, so uh, vertical uh, must be zero, so the constant height, that's exactly what we're talking about. Okay, yep, so 4,503, exactly what we got. Okay, so about 3 uh, meters per second squared and 150 meters. Distance likely to less due to air resistance. Perfect. Okay, so nice question to get. Question 16 coming up, which if I remember correctly is about two guys holding um, uh, a bag. Right, yep, yeah, uh, using pole. Right, okay. <clears throat> so, we've got a situation here where we've got two um, people, two campers, carrying a heavy container. And they're carrying a heavy container of water. Uh, between them. One way to make it easier is to pass a pole through the um, handle of shan. The container weighs 400 newtons and the weight of the pole may be neglected. So the saying it's a very um, low mass pole essentially. What force must each person apply? Well, that's pretty straightforward. 200 newtons each um, upwards to counteract that 400 acting down. Okay so if there's essentially overall there's 400 newtons acting down from that um, container so they need to apply 200 newtons each. Alternative measured method is for each person to hold a rope tied to the handle as shown. So you've got a rope um, tied to the handle. In the space below, draw a feed body force diagram for the containers um, when being held by ropes. Okay, so let's draw a feed body force diagram for that situation. Actually, I probably want a space on my old sheet. Yeah, a bit of space on the bottom there. Okay, so we've got forces acting like that. And there we go, so it's 400 newtons acting down. Okay, so in terms of this free body force diagram, we want to add these angles in there as well. That's 40 degrees, that's 40 degrees. Um, and what T1, let's call it, and T2 for tension. How we know T1 and T2 are equal? Okay, so we can write that on the side. And that's weight, it's W. Remember to always label your arrows. Okay, the weight uh, of the container is 400 newtons, the rope set at 40 degrees to horizontal, that's exactly what we labeled. Show that the force, so that's a, that's a way of them reminding you, you should have labeled that. Um, show that the force each rope applies on the container is 300 newtons. Okay, so each of these ropes, um, needs to take 200 newtons of the load. So you can draw each one of these as like a triangle. You can split this into a triangle, essentially. So your triangle is going to have 400 newtons on this side. Sorry, 200 newtons on this side for one of them, 200 newtons on the other side for the other one. That's too small. Let me draw that bigger. So each one of your sides, so that's uh, your, um, that's your uh, tension there. Okay, and that's going to have an angle of 440 degrees. This horizontal length here, so sorry, this vertical length here, it must take 200 newtons vertically. Okay, so we want to figure out the size of this over here. So we can we can use the idea of this 50 degrees in here. Okay, um, that's our hypotenuse, which is what we want. We have the adjacent. Okay, and we can figure out the size of the hypotenuse because we have the adjacent and the angle. Alternatively, you could move this side of the triangle over to here, okay, and then we'd want the opposite. Okay, so it's you could use sine or cos depending on which way around you, you form your triangle here. Okay, so this side of the triangle can flip over to here, and that will change the function used from sine to cos, because that would make what is currently the opposite if we're using 50 to the adjacent if we're using 40. So if we use 40, this side of 200 newtons is going to be the opposite. If we're using the 50, this side is going to be of 200 newtons is the adjacent. Okay, so let's just go with um, the 50 first, um, and I'll, I'll prove that they're equal afterwards. Okay, so that's the uh, adjacent right now. This is okay. It's the adjacent side. This is the hypotenuse. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, we could we're going to use cos because we want that, and we want the hypotenuse because we're adjacent to the hypotenuse. We're using cos. We want the hypotenuse, so this could be adjacent over cos. That's what we've got over here, adjacent over cos. 
Okay, so the adjacent is 200 newtons, and we'll do that over cos 50. So adjacent is 200 divided by cos 50. Okay, so you can see that's approximately equal to 300 newtons. Okay, you can type that through there, approximately 300 newtons, 311. Okay, so I said that we could flip this over and move it to the other side, and that will just make it um, sine instead, but this time sine of 40. So let's put that through just to prove that. So if I did sine of 40, you know, the able mathematicians in, uh, of you guys will already know this is the case, but it gives exactly the same answer. There we go, let's prove that there. 200 divided by sine of 40 gives the same answer. So either method is correct, okay, either method is fine. So just uh, two reasons why the first method of carrying container is easier. Okay, less force. Less force, each person needs to apply less force. Um, and they, all, they only need to apply force in one direction as well. Okay, in the second method, they need to apply forces in, in um, two dimensions. Okay, while in the first method, that is just in one dimension. Okay, two campers using the rope method find that the container keeps bumping on the ground. Okay, a bystander suggests that moving further apart so the ropes are uh, more near horizontal um, would help. Okay, so explain why this is not a sensible solution to the problem. Okay, they're going to need to apply a larger um, horizontal force, okay, to do this. And this is going to be difficult for them to actually do. Let's double check these ideas of the mark scheme. Uh, just gone past it. Okay, because the tension will be greater or bigger sideways force. That's exactly what we we're saying. Uh, force applied is smaller, it uh, feels lighter. As in, and then again, they're not, so they don't need to apply such a larger force as what we said. Um, and again, um, they're, not, they're having to pull sideways, okay. And we're saying the other one they need to apply upwards. Here's the idea of 200 over cos 40. Uh, oh, right now, you see they've made a typo in here. Uh, oh, no, sorry, they, they, they only get one in three marks if you, if you made that mistake. Um, that only gets one of three marks. Okay, so the idea is if you get to three hundred and ten, you get um, you get the marks or three marks. Okay, so you need to resolve vertically. So they've done two t sine forty. Okay, so what they're saying essentially is that the two tensions over here, if you add those two, because t one is equal to t two, we could say two times the tension. Okay, uh, sine of forty of those. So uh, because they're using sine, they're using the fact that it's over here. It is equal to the weight, okay, which is exactly what we did, but we split it, so we, we put that two in to make that 400 into 200, okay, straightforward what we did there, okay, oops, I'm just flipping to the uh, football that I'm following, okay, so that's uh, the end of um, task four of our ISP questions on statics. So sorry there's only two questions on statics. There's many more questions in the past papers, so feel free to work th through those, uh, and the answers for those are well detailed in the mark schemes on, from the LXO website. So thank you very much for listening, guys. Next week's video um, is going to be on projectile motion.